Dun, 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 dun. Donner. <laughs> yeah, you did better than John and I. I'm not sure if you listened to last week's episode. John and I both tried to do it. It, it didn't really go very well. But we the problem was that we tried to do it. It's all the inflection. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, it's the inflection and the fact that, yeah, John and I just failed. <laughs> right. But also, but we, we tried too hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's it. Dun, 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 the, you see, even Matt failed too. Hard. Matt failed too. <laughs> yeah. You gotta make it flat at the end. Yeah, it, it's just like, it's something cool, something cool, it's just a word. Donner. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I put too much on that. Yeah, that's too much. Now you're messing it up. Yeah. Uh, so with that wonderful intro, hi and welcome to Behind the Hype. With your host is always Brian Dressel. With me as always is Chewy Darso. Hi. Jonathan Hardesty. Howdy. Special guest this week, Mr. Matt Dykes. Good morning, slash evening, slash afternoon, depending on when you're listening to this, actually. Yeah, it's morning for you, it's evening for us, and it's whenever the fuck people are listening to it. Ooh, this works out great yeah. for everybody. Mm. Matt covered them all. That's true. Yeah. We're yeah, a podcast this is one for of those, all times. One of those fun uh, fun evenings where I'm like, all right, I'm going to start my even, end my day by talking to Matt. I'm going to wake up early next morning and talk to Matt again. Because <laughs> I'm just so awesome, right? Right. So we did Lethal Weapon 2 this week. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Moving ever so quickly along. Um, yeah, so here we are. In, uh, yes, Matt is that awesome. I'm not going to be that mean. Um, I usually am. So we're in, what is this, week two? Three? Three, three. of Donner Month. Because I wasn't um, on two. That's right. Uh, three out of five, even though I'm still not 100% sure what we're doing next week yet. I should probably figure that out throughout the rest of this episode. I'll figure it out. Um, but yeah, here we are, week three. And for some reason... I thought, and you probably heard me talk throughout all these weeks, that it'd be a great idea to do Lethal Weapon 2 instead of Lethal Weapon. And after watching Lethal Weapon 2 again, I'm like, wow, that's a lot better than I remembered it. Should have done Lethal Weapon 1. Because yeah, I don't <laughs> think I've ever seen Lethal Weapon 1. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely might, not bad. I might have seen this one when I was little. Might have. I mean, there's things I remembered. Like, I remember the <laughs> to- exploding toilet thing. But there's also the trailer. It was? Yeah. Oh. It ended with like the the toilet seat hitting like the car, and it says they're not taking any more crap on the toilet seat. Yeah. Oh, cute. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Except there was no crap. I was waiting for some poo to fly somewhere. Nowadays, <laughs> if this movie was made, you'd see that poo. Oh yeah, you you don't well, skip on the poo. Someone would have made a joke about the fact, God, it's like poo's been sitting here for hours when they're trying to get him out. I, I think do the like f- about the, the toilet thing. I do like that they actually physically fired a toilet out of a house. For, that, for is a shot. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is pretty amazing. That is pretty amazing. But yeah, so here we are talking Lethal Weapon 2, which I don't dislike. I thought it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it, but it did just kind of make me go like, man, Lethal Weapon 1 is such a better movie. Uh, I kind of wish I'd just taken this opportunity to rewatch it. But at the same time, we still got to watch Lethal Weapon 2, which wow. was not bad. It's better than 3 and 4, and I don't even mind 3 and 4 that much, to be perfectly honest. They do feel starkly different after this one, though. They do. I think so. I this they, is not they, a they feel franchise I was ever involved with. Yeah, they're they're funnier. They definitely lose like the suicidal edge that Mel Gibson has throughout the first two. Like they kind of get rid of that. I mean, that story does really come to a close here, so that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but still good. Uh, should we do a, a very quick rundown so we can start diving into it? Sure. Uh, John, do you feel like doing a rundown? Think you can do it? I'll give it a. a I'll give it a go. <laughs> um. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, Riggs and Murtaugh, they uh, start the movie pursuing some blonde guy in a car, and it's they find that there's money inside, um, what they call it? It was... Kruger. Just gold coins. Just, just call Kruger, gold coins. Yeah, gold coins. And they eventually trace it back to a, a diplomat and try to nail him, but he's got this diplomatic immunity. And what follows is a bunch of back and forth between them and him. Meanwhile, they also have to keep uh, Joe Pesci safe uh, from the mob. And that goes as well as you might think. And uh, it ends at a shootout on a boat. Yeah. That pretty much does it. I mean, the guy yeah. who owns the uh, the ice shop from Mighty Ducks is a real dick in this movie. Um. <laughs> Just so you guys all know, I tried really hard. But I still fell asleep. <laughs> so 
I don't remember the fight on the boat. Yeah, there was a fight on the boat. I remember them going to a boat. Yep, they went to a boat. I remember them going, oh no, they're going to kill all those poor guys that are just working on the dock. They're probably just good old American Union members, and they're just going to murder all of them, because this is the type of movie we're about to watch. I mean, this movie does have the highest body count out of any of the Lethal Weapon movies. Yeah. They do just murder like crazy. They just murder this. everybody. Yeah. They're just a bunch oh, of murdering yeah. detectives. They don't even ask questions half the time. They just go in there and they just start shooting people. <laughs> I mean, it is... Some some I, damn fine police work is what it is. Let's just start yeah. with that. Like the the police work in this movie. I, I honestly feel like that's the best place to start for they, this one. They'd be fired. Like even in the eighties <laughs> standards. Like oh my god. <laughs> I mean, I, I always like the phrase, you know, shoot first, ask questions later. But in Leave the Weapon 2, they shoot first. End of statement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they, don't, they don't even they ask the ask question. questions. questions. <laughs> They'll just make a they joke and leave. And no questions. <laughs> so they just murdered everybody there. I hope they were bad guys. We're out of here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the attitude. And they you are know, all bad guys, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fine. They never really have established how any of them are actually bad guys. Other, they're like, okay, apartheid, well, I mean, South they're, they're African. Not... They have accents. Bad guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Shoot Except for the hot blonde chick. She's not a bad guy. She nicked all those boxes. I mean, her husband was a bad guy. That's yeah. a that's a dig Wait. at Liam Gallagher. Um, huh? <laughs> Liam Gallagher was her husband. That's how I, I know who she is. In real life? Yeah, they're they're married for a long time. Oh. Liam Gallagher is the douchebag from Oasis. Oh. Yeah, that you, guy. You lost me. I'm I sorry. I don't know anything about a lo- Oasis. Liam Gallagher's an asshole. That's all you need to know. <laughs> I'm sorry, Oasis fans, all ten of you listening. <laughs> <laughs> now no, none you. of them. <laughs> Like, dozens Oasis of us. amazing. Dozens. No. <laughs> but uh, well, I don't remember when I realized that they were just like the. Because it's not like in Tucker and Cash, right? Which, Tango and Tango Cash. Tango and Cash, where it's such but, a heightened reality where whatever they do is fine because it doesn't matter. <laughs> because it's Tango and Cash. Yeah. <laughs> this movie has a sense of like taking place in actual reality a yeah. little bit yeah, these are a couple of la detectives yeah and i'm like whoa <laughs> i think it, for me it clicked sometime after joe pesci and joe pesci does his, okay 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 and he knows where like uh, everybody is and like you know where everybody is we're gonna murder everybody and joe pesci's uh, like let's go <laughs> yeah they're just supposed to be hanging out with this guy and they're like all right uh let's go for a murder fest we don't need any warrants we don't need to call our boss we don't need to tell anyone we're going to bring the person we're supposed to be protecting with us yep <laughs> uh, and I we're do, just going to go love... in with our guns out oh and the moment the you know that they're t- um, sorry go back so where the uh, um, where the captains where, where they're talking to the captains like who the hell is this it's like and he goes Leo gets he's like gets get you took a civilian on a bus the civilian you're supposed to be protecting he's like oh I usually stay in the car he's like usually Usually, <laughs> I love, I love that bit so much because like yeah they're very adamant about that. <laughs> but I was most like the moment where I'm like these two these are both two way too high strung guys is when the guy is doing construction holding a nail gun <laughs> he uses the nail gun and they both pull their guns out and like within a split second are about to shoot him. And not even normal shoot. They, like, fall down on the ground for oh, yeah. cover. Like, we just got out of Vietnam about to shoot him. I mean, to be fair, Mel Gibson is a, like, PTSD, suicide, like, contemplating crazy person in the first movie. And the second movie, a little bit better, but it's still there. Like, he likes to remind people he's crazy and does his little, <laughs> like, I'm crazy. <laughs> and, like, we have the IMDb photo up right now. It's just, like, the trailer, and he just looks like a crazy person holding a gun. And you know oh, what yeah. that means? He shouldn't be active. <laughs> yeah, he should, probably shouldn't have a he gun. He should have a desk job. But if he had a desk job, they would have gotten away with their drug money. They're very ambiguous yeah. drug They're money. They're ambiguous. <laughs> so ambiguous. We're bad guys. We, we sell drugs. We don't know who they're selling drugs to or what type of drugs or anything, but they got a lot of money, so it's got to be drugs. I know in the. Well, actually, I mean, I was reading about the Shane Black version. I know the Shane Black version. It was cocaine because at one point, like they blow up a, a plane or something, and cocaine rains down on L.A. like it's snow. Is in the script. Yeah. I want to see that movie. Well, a lot of people want to see <laughs> the wanna, Shane Black one. I just want to yeah. see a movie where 
everyone in LA gets cocained out for one evening and we see what really happens. It's, see, it's an LA, LA in the 90s. Well, <laughs> not everyone. <laughs> But where it's like well, the Shane accident. Black version was a was a lot darker as well. Like it, you know, he killed off Riggs at the end of his uh, at the end of the script. I mean, this one does okay. too, technically. It does. Okay, so what happened? I mean, technically, the last shot in the movie is from the ending that they shot with Riggs dead. They just liked it better, but he's so far yeah. away you can't tell that he's dead. But technically, that is the version of when Riggs is dead. Oh. Yeah, and they just okay. looped them speaking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So help me out with this one. You're talking about different versions. Was there a different cut of this, or is there just like an original script? That we're so like... it's the original script. Uh, the, okay. um, I know nothing Shane about Black this. Script, so. um, well, that's the thing. That it's, it's one of the most sought-after scripts of his as well, because it's, it's lost, this original script. Um, but it was a lot darker. It was. Um, it ended with, I think, like the, the, the big shootout was in the Hollywood Hills or something. There's a big fire and rigs at like... Yeah. Was it like during a fire or something? or something? Yeah, something like like a, a fire in the Hollywood Hills or something. It was the stilt house was the final showdown, yeah. and that was on fire or something. And Riggs sort of like charges in and dies in in the fire or something. And the the bad guys, I, I believe it was supposed to be originally uh, Latin Americans as well, and um, and then it was. Uh, they were a lot more brutal as well. So there was like instead of like you know where they kill all the the detectives who were on uh, Murtaugh's task force. Apparently they actually tortured them in the original script as well, and uh, Riggs was tortured as well. Um, oh, wow. so it, was, it was a really, really, really dark script. Uh, so it never and, made it. it Never made it out of that script stage. Just like there wasn't no any sort of controversy. It was, no, yeah, like, it was, they, it was they too said dark. They had to, basically, yeah, they basically went to Shane Black and said you have to rewrite it, and he's like, no. And then apparently he even offered to give back his money that they paid him to write the initial draft. And then his agent's like, fuck that. Keep your money. You still did the work. They're just going to go hire somebody else. Mm. And that's okay, when Jeffrey okay. Bohm came on. And then Jeffrey Bohm, I think, wrote the third and the fourth, or maybe just the third. He wrote the third, and he did a draft of the fourth, which was then rewritten by another guy called Robert My Robert, Robert something Cayman. I don't okay. remember the surname because it's the same surname as the composer. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, like the the Shane Black version sounds like a, a really good movie, but it doesn't really like it's so the the bit that I've read about it, it's just so fucking dark that I can see why somebody like Donner is like, eh, no, because it wasn't like everyone was fighting for Shane Black. Everyone said no. So it's just kind of like, yeah. well, that was just never going to happen. It is a bummer that Shane Black still to this day says that's his best work. That's kind of a bummer. Yeah. But Can he put it into a novel? I don't think so. I think somebody else owns the rights. Or maybe it actually is lost and it's not just one of those like, it's lost things. But who knows? Yeah. Hmm. Um, but let's start talking about the actual movie that we... Let's yeah, talk yeah. about the movie Sorry for the diversion, but uh, I, wanted, I, was, I was thinking of the previous episode with the Donner cut and I got kind of into a different cut mode. So that's why I was curious. Yeah. So, yeah. Pardon my aside. <laughs> no, all good. I mean, Shane Black still does have a credit for story by it because they still did use elements of his original script, like the stilt house falling down. Um, yeah. Joe mm -hmm. Pesci's character was still in it. He was in it much less. That sort of stuff. So, like, he still does get a credit for it. Um, but now that I've said his name, I, I just kind of move directly into Joe Pesci. Can we just start talking about Joe Pesci in this movie? Because like, oh, everyone yes. is like, this okay. movie's too okay. funny. Okay. It's like, okay. well, it's okay. funny okay. 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 because of Joe Pesci. You know, <laughs> and I... that even the okay thing is so good, they put it into fucking uh, Home Alone. The name of the plumbing van they're on is OK Plumbing, and that's because of yeah. the line in this. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Do, you know, do you know what he based that on? He based it on uh, Disney employees, apparently this Disney employee or something in yeah. Disneyland, because he, he, he was asking them where... where Where's this ride was or something, and the guy was like, "Okay, okay, 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 okay. you go down <laughs> here, you go." And that was like, you know, and he, he took that element out and put it into Leo Getz. And it's so funny because, like, if you look at who was originally supposed to play him, that list is epically long. They like, they went to Devito, they went to yeah. tons of people, and everybody said no. Well, he's got a manic energy in this, and I think that worked really well. Uh, that yeah. was kind of where, like, where I really started to be interested in this movie and like once he showed up i was like oh i kind of see what we're doing in this movie because it's been forever since i've seen bits and pieces of one and two <laughs> so like my memory of this is very foggy and then when 
Pesci shows up, it's like, oh, I, I get the vibe we're going for here. It's kind of like Three I mean, Stooges a little bit. Like, you know, uh, he's the, the one that gets slapped around a little bit. Like, the, the first introduction where... Um, <laughs> Where he's like, he's so like, oh, mean. hey, old fashioned wheel gun, so and like he grabs him, and and then um, he points at Riggs's, and then Riggs slaps him, and he sort of like bounces into Murtaugh, and Murtaugh's like, get off me. <laughs> and then within you know two minutes, he's about to get murdered, and they push him through a window into a yep. pool. <laughs> it is very slapsticky. Oh yeah, I mean Riggs even watches Three Stooges at some point, and yeah, apparently that's because Mel Gibson loves the Three Stooges. So well, he... Three Stooges is pretty funny. I mean, they are pretty funny. Yeah. But that that slapstick nature is pretty good, and I, I also love the <laughs> Danny Glover comes running down after they go flying out of the window. You're my partner. Why do you come down after me? And Joe Pesci's like, Yeah, why do you come after us? Yeah. And, <laughs> I, I just love general, right, so like, Shut up! I'm seven floors up. <laughs> I just like the juxtaposition between the two characters with the TV things. Honestly, when I think about it right now, mm-hmm. because we don't we only see the TVs like twice, really, like majorly where they're kind of important. Mm-hmm. So we see the first time it's with uh, Murtaugh? Murtaugh's family, and they're about to watch the commercial that his daughter's <laughs> in. And the thing, on, like, I was very distracted during that entire scene at the very beginning to be like, wait, what are they watching? This looks familiar. Like, I think I know what that is. And then I just see the big tales from the crypt come on their television. I'm like, oh, they're watching Tales from the Crypt. Oh, how much fun. Well, Donner was also involved in Tales from the Crypt. He was? Yeah. Oh. But then his uh, daughter's commercial comes on, <laughs> which happens to be for, you know, safe sex, you know. Just make sure you got some condoms. Which for Murtaugh is like a Tales from the Crypt thing. <laughs> like, what kind of terrible nightmare could it be bestowed upon him? And having his daughter in a condom commercial is one of them, I would imagine. <laughs> so that's just like his character's like mindset about how he's just always thrown into all these situations that are absolutely grotesque. But he's very much a participant in all of them at the same time. And then you have uh, Mel Gibson's character. What's his Riggs. name? Riggs. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, I was not invested in this franchise. <laughs> um, Riggs, and he is just a screwball, violent, slapstick man who, of course, loves the Three Stooges. Like, I just think those two are the choices of having those two shows associated with the characters is a really good choice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I agree. That, 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 now that you point that out, yeah, no, that's a really good. A very good insight to the characters, and one that they almost put like you you would blink and miss it if you weren't careful. Oh uh, yeah, so it's... and it's just it's another one of those notch to Donner. Like Donner was an excellent filmmaker. Like he he put the work into the details, and you know, one of the people on the show really picked up on it. Way to go, Chewie! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, if he was involved with Tales from the Crypt, I don't know if that was a specific character choice then, or it just happens to work for me. I think it kind of works. Even if it was unintentional, like, who cares? Like, it still works. Yeah. It still works as a thematic thing, especially going to that thing. I- I'm going to give a-, a brief personal story about this movie. I apologize. Um, no, I don't apologize. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> I got I'm real sorry. aggressive there. Uh, you know what? <laughs> I'm standing by it. When I was a kid and I watched this movie with my dad and that commercial came up, I remember asking my dad, why are they so mad about that commercial? And he just went, drop it. <laughs> your dad was like, see see your dad your dad does not participate in any tales from the crypt storylines no he, he does shuts not it down he shut it down real fast <laughs> that's amazing i do like uh later on in the uh the film as well though when uh they're in the the squad room and metal's like why is everyone sitting at my desk and they all get up and they've, they've all <laughs> they've a rubber plant <laughs> That rubber were those used? No. I it, it don't looked like think some of them were so. used. They but some of them, you know, some brands just have a lot of lubricant on them already. Not in them. Well they probably put some stuff in them. I bet they did. That's the very... that's what I'm questioning. <laughs> none, of the, none of these are very good cops. No. This is not dirty shine cops. a very good light on the LAPD at all. No, not, no, not that though, that's really an easy thing to do. But those condoms symbolize that they're all dirty cops. <laughs> the, the woman that's in all of the James Cameron movies, I don't remember her real name. Oh, man. Uh, I love her death. 
when oh, she's going to go, when she's about to go, you know, do a nice dive into the pool, Janet yeah. Goldstein, Goldstein. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then she yeah. just does this amazing flip. She flips in the air like <laughs> three or four times. Like she, she gets, gets some amazing air right there. I also Olympic think she level. might have been fine. <laughs> it depends. Whether or not the blast like knocked her out, because if the blast knocked her out, she would she would drown when she got into the water. And oh, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you do a flip like that, though, and you can just like per- everyone can think you're dead, and you just go off and live your own life. You're, like, you- yeah, that's it. That's it after a jump like that. Because let's be honest, if it was Riggs or Murtaugh, they would have survived. Yeah, they would be fine. <laughs> but maybe I mean, this is their plot armor. So, funny story about that though. So the that shot was originally scheduled way later on. Um, but the actress found out she was pregnant really early into filming, and instead of replacing her, which would have probably been the easier thing to do, they moved the schedule around so they could do that shot before she started to show. Mm. Which I think is a real credit to sort of like Donna, I guess, in in like a, in a way that like you know, yeah, it probably would have been easier to just like reshoot the the very little things that they'd done and recast someone. I mean, but. You know, but they actually either. didn't. They they changed the schedule around. I can't yeah, yeah. Cry for a moment, you I'm you sure. did. <laughs> it's a low bar to beat. I know. <laughs> could you could you kill could you kill us too? I didn't hear it. She said that's better than Joss Whedon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Will that stay in? <laughs> <laughs> you have to listen and find out. Joss Whedon would have been like. Either get rid of it or you're recast. <laughs> That's just so fucked up, been... but also kind of true. It's exactly true. <laughs> just what just would have been bullying them into it, saying, are you sure you want to keep it? Have you ever thought of an abortion? Mm? Oh, my God. What a horrible <laughs> scumbag. Yeah. Um, so more about this movie. Scumbags. Oh, my God. Yeah. Movie yeah. Every going, back to, like, going back to like, Richard Dunn, who is absolutely the complete opposite, like the nicest guy ever it's amazing I mean, like, for me watching these richard donner films and he, he he's known as being such a sweet man yeah and these movies from what i've been watching so far because i'd never seen the omen and i've never seen, you seen the iron donner man cut i never seen the donner cut you call iron this. man 2 sorry <laughs> <Superman too. laughs> i would have loved well, to see iron, iron man 2 the donner like, cut he I is kind of iron man okay there's a okay. secret right there uh He's very Man much... of Iron. No, wait. <laughs> he, he, all of his characters are so male, machismo. Oh, yeah. Like, a um, traditional sense of what a man should be type of thing. Mm-hmm. And normally, that's incredibly toxic. And out of, you know, the, the Omen and Superman 2, these guys are, like, the most toxic I've seen so far. Oh, yeah. Superman is so traditional, but not toxic at all. And the dad or husband in The Omen, very traditional, very British. He's not even British. He's American, but he's in a British. He feels British. He feels British. (laughs) No offense. Uh, He's like masculine stoic of an old time. uh, But he also was caring and yeah everything so it's just really interesting for going from that to this and just thinking about him as what i've heard of as a director i'm just now become watching donner films really i wasn't yeah. wasn't really watching them before it's just, it's interesting to me well I, he's very much like the opposite of michael bay who everyone says is a terror and he loves his mochismo yeah i mean maybe it has something to do with shane black like shane black does write just brutal fucking characters he kind of always has probably always will uh and this did really come from the brain of uh of shane black like the first one was a shane black Mm -hmm. written thing so that could have a lot to do with it and donner's just doing the best he can because he does soften them around the edges here and there like he does make uh he does make murtaugh a pretty good dad like he doesn't blow his stack at his daughter's condom commercial he's more so his problem with his daughter's condom commercial is the fact that the entire station is watching the condom commercial. Yeah. Not the fact that she was in it, just the way that it's going to affect his life. I know yeah. that doesn't make it that much better, but that it, it does make it better. I mean, yeah, it's, it's unexpected in a good way. Time situation. Exactly. Yeah. If, if he was a dad nowadays, he'd probably be like, whatever, it's her body. Yeah. 
but even so, what, what I'm saying is like that that could have gone a very different way of how could you do this? That wasn't the problem. It was more so like Riggs, how could you tell everyone to watch this commercial? I didn't know what it was. Like that was the problem. Yeah. Now, so I do appreciate that. Now I'm going to get a rubber tree. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> and then he laughs about it eventually. He does. He so like, embarrassed. So that's what I mean. Like he does. Like they do dull the edges. They are very sharp edges. But you know, I still wouldn't want to like slap my hand on them. But I mean, Murtaugh would probably be a much better cop if he wasn't with Riggs. But yeah, <laughs> R- Riggs seems to. He's one of those characters where everyone's just like, "You're crazy. We shouldn't listen to you, but we're going to anyways." I just, and it's just so fucking like. I appreciate it. I enjoy it. But it's also like, it's so cliche at this point that it's comical where he's like, he just found out that his, the killer that he's been fighting this whole movie is the same killer that killed his wife from before the first movie. And then he killed his girlfriend again in this movie. And he's going to go kill him. And he calls up his partner. He's like, I'm not a cop tonight. It's like, shut up. By the way, what (laughs) happened to her body? It just stayed underwater. They just left it. No, no, he, no, he carried it around. around I was kidding. Her. I was kidding. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. He's just he walking was around. He pacing with... around with her corpse, and then the next thing we see is him in his car driving. Yeah, he gave it to a morgue. <laughs> <laughs> he just left it Did with the others. Did they ever go back to her? <laughs> I, no. I like how the immediate thought was like, he gave it to someone. Like He gave it to She's some like uh, beach bum. Yeah. The, the, he the just left somewhere. Sam, the dog, with her. Just like just yeah, watching he left Sam the dogs. Sam's in all four movies. Sam's gonna eat her. <laughs> <laughs> That's what dogs do eventually. If you don't give them food and they're by a dead body. That's cats. No, it's dogs too. Oh, it's more cats. It's cats will just do it sooner. Yeah, <laughs> cats yeah, are just kick. like cats are waiting. Dogs have no other options. <laughs> right, right. Dogs have to fight with their loyalty. Uh, to I mean, the human cats, race, cats and are cats waiting are like... to eat you before you're dead. So every now and again, <laughs> I'm sure they'll look at you and they go, "I might eat you tonight." <laughs> that's why you never let cats in your room at night yeah so what's the name of the pirate in uh princess bride robert dread pirate roberts yes dread thank you pirate, dread pirate, pirate. you know it's like the way he says to people he's like you know i might kill you tonight yeah. might kill you tomorrow <laughs> i'll kill you in the morning <laughs> sleep well <laughs> that's cat God, that's such a good book yeah. and movie um i don't know now we're i keep we're going everywhere that's fine um what, what have we missed? I, I know there's a ton of stuff in this movie that we can talk about. Do you want to talk some set pieces? Well, I was going to say, like, it's stunt work. But, yeah, like, set set pieces and stunt work. Um, yeah, that's kind of go hand in hand. They, they just... The, the stuff they do in this film, and it's all real. There's no CGI. It's just... They push the envelope in the stunts. Construction is a co-star. So... Film. Oh, absolutely. I would love to find someone and talk to them about what it was like to be construction on this. And then special effects to make sure it all, you know, didn't kill people at the end. And they're well, just pulling it all apart. That house shot is a half million dollar shot. Yeah. The, so they <laughs> did insane. pull, they did pull down, well, they, they blew down a real house. And um, it was, funnily enough, it's not the, it's not the actual house that you see the, the front of. Because I've been to that house and it's still standing. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was, the, so it was like a, a house that so the construction went in and they like used chainsaws and apparently they chainsawed like all the the structural stuff halfway and when they blew oh, that and it went down they they'd drawn a line uh, on the road and said that's where it's going to stop and it and it stopped and hit that line I, I don't know how they managed to do that but the way that they did the controlled uh, explosion and like the the, the prep work and they they knew exactly where it was going to was going to actually that's, stop, and I think that's amazing. I know exactly how they did it. Math. It, math. Yeah. <laughs> they did a shitload of math. Shit, yeah. shitload of math. These are probably people not like me, not like Brian, who went to film school. These are the people I meet on a daily basis who's like, you know, I got a, got like an engineering degree, and I got out of college, and then, you know, I had a friend who said, hey, you want to work on this movie? And then, hey, I was working in movies. Well, yeah, because in film school, they're like, fuck math. It's <laughs> <laughs> like the first thing you right, learn in right. film school. I work with so many people who have such more impressive degrees than I do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and, they and, do and this type of shit. I never even picked up my degree. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I think so I got an email. They don't mine. require you. Uh, in film school, they definitely uh, discourage you from putting skill points into smart things. <laughs> well put. <laughs> I talk good. I English well. Um, We're all working. 
true. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope none of our bosses listen to this podcast. Um, for me, though, like when it comes to like set pieces in this, like, the scene that I will always remember, and I have a feeling a lot of people agree with me and, or feel the same way, that always sticks with me is the bomb in the toilet seat. Yeah. Like, that's my favorite sequence in the whole movie. I think it's just so well done. It's both funny and incredibly tense. Uh, Danny Glover and Mel Gibson are both super on point throughout the whole thing. I just, I love that sequence. I think it's just great. It's so good, like, the way that Riggs will not leave Murto as well. Like, where he's, he's telling him to get out, and he's just like, no. And, and then he's like, Riggs, out. And he doesn't even say no, just looks at him and is like, all right, fine. And it's just, I, I love the, the the performance in that and just the sort of the way it's directed as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's so well done. Like it sort of like shows it shows their relationship and how close they are. Well, yeah, because in the beginning of the movie, I'm just wondering like, why is Mel Gibson's character, why is Riggs there with them all the time? Why is he around all the time? Like, because I'm still very fo- foggy on the first movie, but then when we get to that scene, that specific scene, and they just have their moment, it was like, oh. They've got something deep here. Yeah, it's like they're like, they're like family, uh, really. Yeah. In this one, and in all really... of them, to be fair, going forward, like you know, the first one is kind of like it's less less like family because they're sort of like forced together. But every everyone that comes after it is like Riggs is a part of the family. Yeah, and I think both of them together really sell that point. Like it really works well. Um. I should probably go back and watch three and four at some point. Mm. I remember four getting horrible reviews, and whenever I watched it, I was like, "This isn't that bad." Maybe, maybe I won't like. They're it all much pretty good films, to be fair. Chris Rock's in it. That's all I know. And I, the only thing I remember disliking in four was I'm like, "Why is Joe Pesci still here?" That was my only thing that I remember. And that, I saw that when I was pretty young, and I still remember just like, "What is he doing here?" He feels so out of place at this point. Sure. He's just hanging around. He's like, he's like a bad rash. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Uh, so, should we talk about the thing that is the linchpin in this movie? I guess we should. Yeah. And then we'll move into favorite moments? Yeah, sure. All right, what's the yeah. linchpin? Apartheid. I was trying to avoid it as much as I could. Oh. Um, well, no, but you're right. It's such a thing. It, it really There is, is an interesting reason why it's in the film, though. So, what? in the first film, they had this anti-apartheid um, thing on Murtaugh's fridge, just a set decoration. And they got a load of letters about it. Some, some of them were like, "Yeah, yeah, glad that you're sort of like showing like against apartheid." And then there was a there was a quite a lot of people who wrote in who were like, "No, oh, this is ridiculous. How dare you try and you know tell me that apartheid's wrong or something like that?" And they, like it's like ridiculous stuff. And um, I believe I think Richard Donner got some threats as well for for putting wow. it in. Um, and then they were like, in the second one, they were like, right, well, let's just make all the bad guys um, South African apartheid supporters. And it was just like, it's like a big fuck you to the to the people who were like, it was like so annoyed at them for having a, a little sticker. It's like, well, let's make the whole the whole second film around apartheid then. Hmm. And, that is interesting. And, I mean, did Danny Glover play uh, Nelson Mandela in something? Yeah, I think in between uh, Lethal Weapon and Lethal Weapon 2, he, there was a TV movie, I think, that he played Nelson Mandela in. Huh. Yeah, because I, I remember reading, like, there was, a like, a like one of those, like, tidbit things somewhere on the internet that said, like, they played this movie unannounced on TV after Nelson Mandela won his presidency in 94. Huh. Yeah. Like, people really attached themselves to that part of this movie. So that is good. I mean, it did bring it up for a lot of people who probably in America were just like, that's not our country, not my problem, I'm not going to pay attention to it. And this I mean, movie, the bit, since it was so popular, really does throw it in your face. Yeah, the bit in the consulate is hilarious as well. Like oh, where, yeah. where um, Leo's <laughs> say, talking about, oh, my friend wants to go to South Africa. I want you to talk him out of it. And then he, he's like, I found, I found. And he comes in and goes, and the, guy, the look on the guy's face is brilliant. And just... Um, black. Yeah, <laughs> because you're black. <laughs> <laughs> it's, such, it's so funny. And then like later on when, when he's... Uh, when, uh, Joe Pesci's recounting it's like but 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 you're Blick <laughs> he's Blick <laughs> I just love the way that they just absolutely rip the piss out of uh, the, the the guy and I just love how A he I, I still don't know how he got into the consulate because surely 
they like security would have not let him in. But B, I I'm just sh- love how he just starts. Yeah, he showed his badge. Or something. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's probably it's also needed for the movie. But yeah, yeah. It's, it's needed for the movie, and it's also needed for. It's not my favorite moment, so I'm not gonna ruin anything right now. But it, I think it might be the best line in the entire movie, and I'm pretty sure it's improved. Is right after he goes, "You're black," and they cut to Joe Pesci, and he goes, "You are." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just love just that. In case. <laughs> And then he's like, um, and then Murto goes on his rant as well, and it's like, free South Africa, you dumb son of a bitch. And then, because like Joe Pesci's just been repeating like random words, and then it like, like, free South Africa, you dumb son of a bitch, you dumb son of a bitch. I, I think that's the hardest I laughed in the entire movie was at the, you are. Yeah. <laughs> it just, it follows it with, he is. It's like, you are. Oh, yeah. He you is. Are. He is. <laughs> Thanks, Leo. <laughs> right on point. Oh, man. So, it, to, outside of all the context, this movie is just interesting to me in that regard because it's just such a topic that since we were young, I was nine. Not, not even nine. Yeah. Sorry. This came out in 1989. Yeah, so I've been three. Yeah. I would have been. What's the I same can, age as I Corinth? can do math. I would have been six. Uh, and then apartheid officially ended in like 1990, right? I honestly don't remember. Pretty soon after this movie came out. Yeah. So it was not really in our spheres of thought growing up. And we just hear the word every now and then and be like, that was bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I learned, I've learned about it so much more since Trevor Noah has yeah. been in our lives than <laughs> I ever did before. And then watching, uh, District Nine, since yeah. it was an. I was funny. Set. I was thinking that. I was thinking that I learned a lot of about apartheid just from District Nine as well, because because that's just based on apartheid completely. Yeah. yeah, and that's like all as me being a white woman, young white woman growing up in America, like it just was never in my sphere of thought. And so watching this movie is just intriguing because it makes me need to go Wikipedia apartheid more and be like, so what all exactly happened? And then you think about millennia, the generation Z or whatever underneath us, what are they going to know? If they ever watch this movie, it's going to feel like it's just a character in the movie and that it wasn't even a real thing. Like the, it's, yeah. it's just such a moment in history type of film because of that. It really, and it's the only one out of the four that really has that, like stamp in history i mean the other one's like a product of the 80s but that's about it this is the only one that really has like a severe time stamp on it yeah which is interesting really in in a way because you know it's it's an action film but you know a lot of action films they they don't have that very specific time stamp on it whereas this one does because because they would like you know they wanted to kind of bring attention to apartheid a little bit more and i I think I was Sorry, go ahead. I feel like if this movie was made today for some sort of cause going on somewhere in the world today, people would get mad at it for being political. Be like, get yeah. the politics out of my entertainment. Yeah, I mean, social media has kind of ruined any chances yeah. of that. Oh, it's it's hilarious on being on like Star Trek groups and every now and again a really right wing guy will come on and say, "God, I don't want what. Why do they have to be so political?" And it's like, have you ever watched Star Trek? It's been political since 1966. You know, <laughs> it was political when it started. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, like, and you just you you sort of like you see those comments and things like, that and you just think, oh, for God's sake! Like seriously, like something that has always been like that. So yeah, imagine if you go from Lethal Weapon to Lethal Weapon two today, and it had just been like, it all have been like Rotten Tomatoes reviews. Like there have been like so many people just giving it one one out of ten on IMDb be- just because it's it dares to you know have a message. As well oh, as yeah. being entertaining. This comes out in 2020, 2021, it gets review bombed. No yeah. no other way around it. People absolutely yeah. review bomb it. Um, let's go into something fun. Let, let's go into our, our favorite moments. Are we ready for favorite moments? Indeed. Yeah. I'm going to let Chewie go first because, you know, she only saw, we'll go with a, a generous 80% of the movie. Hey, <laughs> I tried. I 
literally <laughs> sh- was shaking myself. I'd be like, stay awake. For those of you who don't uh, get to watch movies with Chewie, which is pretty much everyone but me, um, <laughs> when she gets in this mode of I need to stay awake, it's very obvious because she'll go from laying down to sitting up to laying down to sitting up to sitting up at the end of the bed to sitting at the back of the bed to sitting on the side of the bed. It's like, oh, she's a, she's very tired right now. <laughs> it's hard, but I've worked. But I've worked. My body has a stamp on it where it goes, you're going to sleep between 9.30 and 10. And if you try to stay awake past that, you're having a very difficult time. (laughs) I am so close to being 40, it hurts. (laughs) Uh, Got those 40-year-old aches. My 40, or my my favorite. (laughs) By the way, I've also told Brian to let me know when he thinks I need to go get a CAT scan because my brain seems to be working less and less. I've told you to do it like 100 times. You keep forgetting. Hey. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, <Irony. laughs> i love the pool boy in uh, the when they're going to go investigate the stilt house the first time because it's one of those this is just one of those movies where i'm picking up on shit yeah all the time and they're pulling in they're parking and they're parking behind this guy who just is just fussing with his truck and he's so obviously fussing with his yeah. truck. And he looks like he is an extra they picked up off the street because they forgot to hire someone. I think he's part <laughs> of the camera department. Uh, and I'm like, what's he doing there? Like, is this guy going to be important later? And then you have Mel Gibson Riggs, who apparently just steals his shit at some point and pretends to be a pool guy. And then they cut back to him, and he's still by his truck going, hey, where's my stuff? Like, he's, just, he's just there flopping his arms around. And I'm like, world's worst pool guy? boy. <laughs> Wait, why Definitely, is because there's no there? pools around does there anyway. Anyone on, does anyone on this cliff face road have a pool? I mean, that's a fair question. Like, I'm ve- I was very invested in this no dialogue character. <laughs> I mean, well, they even asked that. Back. Like, they, there's no pretty pool, hey, mate. This house is built on stilts. <laughs> <laughs> so it just deepens the mystery even more. Like, who the hell is this guy? And yeah. where does he think he's going? <laughs> so what we find out in a later version of this movie is that that's when Mel Gibson just robbed an FBI undercover agent. <laughs> 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 um, all right, so I have quite a few that would be, like, my quote-unquote favorite moment. Um, but I think... Now I just want to go back to the one that I said wasn't going to be my favorite moment. Because the more I think about it, the more it is. I am going to go back to that one. I'm going to go back to just Joe Pesci reaffirming to Danny Glover that he is black. <laughs> that, that is, It's just so fucking funny. I was going to go to one of my backups, but I'm like, no, that might be my favorite moment yeah. in this movie. It is very funny. Uh, Matt, why don't you go? So I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to have two. Um... My favourite action sequence is the shootout on the beach. I just think it's so well choreographed. Like, you've got the the helicopters in the distance, like, the, the sound design of it as well. You you can start to hear them in the distance before you see them. And then, then you've got, like, you know, you've then got the, the helicopters like shooting Riggs' trailer, which uh, apparently they used 4,000 squibs in that trailer. Um, wow. Yeah, that to, 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 that's why it just it and it just like gets basically Swiss cheesed, um, and then you've got <laughs> squib cheese. <laughs> Damn it! Why didn't I think of that? And then you've got the, the you know the bit where um, it's just it's just wild. Like it, you know, he gets he gets out, he gets a, a weapon, he, he kills a couple of guys, and then you know he gets onto the top of his trailer, shoots shoots up one of the helicopters which has landed, and then you've got the the other helicopter comes up behind him and flies across. It's just so such a, a fantastic action sequence, and it just keeps this like going and going and going to like you know the bit where he's then in the truck and then he shoots at the the helicopter, and I just I think it's so well done, and it's always been. Uh, one of the like the action sequences in all the Lethal Weapon films, where I've always sort of thought, yeah, that's 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 just brilliant. That it's so, it, you know, in terms of like how how you put together an action sequence, I think it's it's fantastic. And, and again, it's all because of the fact that it's all real as well. There's like there's no miniature. It's all you know full scale. There's there's no sort of like cheating around it. They you know they 
the great thing about these films is the the stunt work. They, they you know they do everything full scale if they can. You know, like yeah. to the point they actually destroyed a full house. You know, like you know any other film they probably would have done that as a miniature, but no, they they did it full scale. Um, I, I just, I, just I, awesome. I think it's fantastic. And then my other one is the comedy is just um, Joe Pesci going on going off on one about drive throughs It's like they <laughs> fuck you with the drive through. They fuck you with the drive. They know you're gonna be miles away before you find out you got fucked. <laughs> And apparently, <laughs> Pesci went on for about five minutes or something in that, <laughs> just just going off on one. It wasn't scripted or anything like that. It was just him uh, improvising. That's hilarious. You know what amazed me about that? I was like, when the hell did Subway have drive-throughs? <laughs> I know, and I know, and I'm like, are they surprised did that their they order got goofed up? Then? Yeah, they don't have them. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, that did strike me as very odd when I watched it, and I kind of put a pin in my the back of my mind for later, just like, a drive through at Subway. Weird. <laughs> Somewhere I want a drive through And then you can see when they pull out from the drive through there's just someone sitting at the drive through window with, like, a bare room. Like, they're just standing in this, like, bare closet with, like, nothing in there. It's like, well, where's all the condiments that they'd be putting all the food on the sandwiches? Somebody so, like, Google that. Did they have drive throughs at some point? I think we just stumbled upon a product placement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not a very good one, though, is it? Because it's basically yeah. saying, don't, don't use it because they fuck up your order. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the lesson. Don't use a, a drive through from Subway. Um, so for my favorite moment, uh, I would use... I like the conversation that they have with their chief. Um, kind of near the beginning where they're like, it's a shit assignment. This is a shit assignment. And it kind of caps like punctuates at the very end with the i don't give a fuck and eventually like rigs being that that way with the cigarette yeah and i think the wordplay there and the back and forth is really well done well paced and very clever and quick and uh yeah i really enjoyed that moment i think the the, all the sort of interaction with the captains is brilliant because i think like they like you know he's not in these films a lot but it's the same character and it's the same actor who keeps coming back but they always seem to have a really good chemistry like earlier like very like straight after the the very opening sequence where like you know the captain saying to Murtaugh like Murtaugh all that damage you caused downtown it's coming out of the department's budget and Murtaugh just fires back with fine paid off in Kruger ends I just it's, <laughs> it's so you know that the the sort of the dialogue and the interplay between them has always been really good and I think it's you know I think the actors uh, called Steve Catan or something like that, and he's he's one he's someone who shows up in a lot of Donner films. Like I, I I rewatched the original Superman film. Funnily enough, the weekend before Donner died, it was it was really weird, uh, and he's in that and he plays a cop in that. Um, so yeah, it's it's he's like one of those actors who I think works with Donner a lot, but he's he's. Really good with with the you know sort of like fitting in well with uh, Gibbs, Mel Gibson and Danny Glover's sort of um, chemistry as well, and they they play off each other really well. They do. Yeah. All right. Are you guys ready for double features? Oh yes. All right. So my double feature. Th- this one's be pretty easy, um, and I'm really hoping I'm not taking anybody's, but I'm going with the other guys. Mm. Um. And it's just, yeah, I, I don't really need to say anything more than that. Like, if you want two buddy cop movies, I, I'm always going to, if I ever have to pair a movie that is a buddy cop film with another one, it's always going to be The Other Guys. It's such a good movie. Unless I'm reviewing The Other Guys, in which case, it might still just be Watch The Other Guys twice. No, it'd be The Nice Guys. <laughs> That'd be pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chewie, what about you? Probably Tango and Cash. Because <laughs> if I had to choose between the two of them, I'd be like, I want to watch Tango and Cash. Well, you're supposed to be watching both of them. So you're I just... know. <laughs> but I'll watch this one first and be like, I'm going to watch Tango and Cash. <laughs> that works. Uh, Matt, what about you? I'm going to just like go for the low-hanging fruit and just Lethal Weapon, the first one. Because like, I didn't watch the first one when like in preparation for this. I just it was just doing this the second one. But... When I got to the end of watching the second one, the first time, I was like, man, I really want to go back and watch the first Lethal Weapon as well. So you got that feeling that I did at the beginning of this episode of like, this wasn't a bad movie at all, but I kind of wish I watched the first one. 
Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen the first one. All the little things that I remembered from Lethal Weapon was in this movie. Oh, that's interesting. Because does he do the shoulder yeah. dislocate? Oh, he mm-hmm. does that in the first no. one too. That, that's in this one and then everyone. No, else. no, no, it's the, so, yeah, it's the second so one. It's just this one. Yeah. I've no, I don't know yeah. anything about the first movie. Huh. Which is quite funny because like I, I had the second one and the third one on video when I was a kid, and I didn't see the first one before I'd seen the second and third one. Um. So yeah, it's, but I, yeah, I I just would go back. Watch the first one and then the second one, in that order. <laughs> yeah, I probably should watch it. It's a good movie. It is a very good movie. It's it's a very well written movie as well. It's like Shane Black's first script. Ah, Gary Busey's in it. Yeah, he is. Yep. If before he went absolutely batshit crazy, but was still a little I'm bit batshit sure. crazy. John, what about you? Uh, I'm gonna go for a a double feature of sequels. We're gonna watch this one, Lethal Weapon Two, and then Die Hard Two. Ooh. And it's just like same level of action, just scrappy male characters, explosions, and it keeps the buzz going, as it were. And you'll get to see the same gun. Mel Gibson's handgun in this movie is the same gun that they use in all the Die Hard movies. Oh. Same prop. Yeah. Nice. It's nice. the, it's the yeah. same. Yeah, the same prop. It's um, it's the same same one that uses in two, three, and four as well. Yep. Apparently, uh, Mel Gibson, Bruce Willis like that gun. <laughs> it's a good gun. <laughs> I feel like it works. This joke in there somehow. I'm sure there is. I, I was trying to figure it out myself. Yeah. But uh, you know. It feels good in their hand. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Found it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, let's do the uh, the quickest round of plugs and say goodbye. I will go first for the show and every the show on the ATH Network. Be sure to check out athpod.com. Uh, we have binge buddies coming up. We're just about done with season one, and then we're going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, but Matt's here as well. I mean, we're having so much fun with this one, aren't we, Matt? Yeah, I cannot wait to talk about the next two episodes this Holy evening. Because, oh, well, <laughs> this evening for me, tomorrow for you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, but my God, the the two episodes we have to record are the, uh, it's the citizenship test and then the orgy. The orgy, yeah. And, Fuck. <laughs> the, the citizenship test is a great episode. The orgy might be one of the funniest ones I've ever seen. This one doesn't count. Don't tell anyone this was a bad orgy. <laughs> oh, I thought Mike threw a bad orgy. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Mike. <laughs> Ooh, is he a babadook? No, I'm a babadook. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, show's so fucking good. So be sure to check out uh, who, what, when, where, and why we do in the shadows over at Binge Buddies. Uh, and watch the show as well, because the show is fucking brilliant. I mean, it really is. John, what about you? As always, Demon Days, the actual play podcast that we do. Uh, we're, we got another episode out this past week, and uh, we're gearing up for some big battles coming up. And that's about all I can say. Combat! I'll do better when I record <laughs> my intro. Um, <laughs> Chewy, Matt, anything to plug? Hmm. You legally cannot plug the show that you're working on yeah, because I'm sitting here. You're sitting there, and I don't know if I'm supposed to be talking about it either. I don't remember what NDA I signed. I just signed it. I know what I signed, and you can't talk about uh, it. You should, you should, um, prob- you should probably, um, probably, probably get that CAT scan then if you can't even remember the, what was in the NDA nope. you signed. None of us ever read our NDAs. Read your contracts. No. The only problem, the problem is everything's digital now. I used to like gauge how important my NDA was. By how thick it was, like how many pages it was, <laughs> and now it's all digital, and I ain't gonna count how much, how long the scroll is. <laughs> so like, it's give you a page like, count. Yes, yes, I consent. Yeah, yeah, I won't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants it's to two- talk about it. <laughs> I mean, we just want it's a two-minute scroll, so it's very serious. <laughs> If there's a second page, fine. I won't talk about it. So, so your NDAs are just basically turned into I have uh, I have read and agreed to the terms and conditions, right? Yeah. Uh huh. Pretty much. Yeah. World's yeah, biggest okay. lie. <laughs> yeah, but the the problem is that you can get way more fucked from your NDA than you can the terms and agreements. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Have you seen that South Park episode? That's fair. That that is that is fair. <laughs> Would you, you like to be a to human sentai pad? No, I would not. So I could disagree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. 
right, uh, Matt, anything to plug? Uh, no. I should have let you do the binge buddies. I'm sorry, stomped all over. That. Yeah, binge buddies. Go go listen to binge buddies. Well, like, you know, if you if you don't if you're not into who uh, what we're doing the shadows, I don't want to know you to be fair because you know, what's <laughs> wrong with you? Uh, but there's other things that we've done we've covered in the past. You know, Venture Brothers, Frisky Dingo, uh, the Resident Evil movies, and if you're not into any of them, just 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 get yeah. in the sea. Yeah, I, I don't think we're we're the show for you if you're not in any of that. <laughs> I don't think you're you're the person for me if you're not in, yeah. into into any of that. To be Definitely fair. not. Um, yeah. If you hate the Exicles, that's fine. Go ahead and hate the Exicles. <laughs> the Go show, on. not not the characters. Yes, of course. Be very clear on that. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that show. All right, is that it? We all done our, our pluggity plugs. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Then yeah. I should then I should say goodbye. Yeah, I gotta stay awake for Cyborg. <laughs> You do not have to stay awake for Cyborg. Yes, I do. You, you get to stay awake for Cyborg. <laughs> I'm okay, very excited that, about going so, back on our Van Dam kick. Van Dam. All right. What, note what, to self: why? Cyborg podcast spinoff. Should do you guys a Van Dam about it. A Van Dam month. I mean, Chewie and I've been doing like a Van Dam year. We yeah. just took a bit of a break. <laughs> yeah. We. How many? Did we watch like six or seven. That's, I think six. See you later, bozos.